Okay. We had a good coffee break. Um, so we've got well, one, two, three, four, five, six, 15 minute talks for this session uh, laboratory, lab astronomy methods and techniques. Uh, starting with Natalie Health and Lawrence Livermore talking about lab astrophysics for high resolution X ray spectroscopy. Hi. So in this session, we are going to talk about why lab astro um, is important and what it can do for your spectrum. Um, so just as an uh, easy example in the beginning, you can see um, a spectrum from uh, Capella of, observed with ASCA, where you can see right here that um, from the FIT model, there's quite a discrepancy between the model and the observed spectrum. And the reason for that is that um, in the model for the uh, neon-like and the um, sodium-like iron, there was only uh, n equals three to uh, and four to two transitions included, but lab spectra could actually show you that the n equals uh, five and larger contributions can add um, over 10% to your um, spectral intensity. Um, so that is one of the examples for how the lab can um, improve your models and show you where you need to improve them and help you identify and interpret your um, space spectra. Um, there is um, a lot of ways how you can do lab astro. Uh, we will focus on the uh, X-ray spectroscopy parts and largely I will only talk about the experiments and uh, leave theory to uh, other people. Uh, there's also a variety of um, different experiments that you can do to benchmark um, and expand your atomic data, um, but I largely focus on um, the electron beam ion trap and uh, ignore things like tokamaks and um, dust, which Joanna Ioana showed us earlier that is important as well. Um, so here you can see a picture of the um, Livermore uh, EBIT, you can like EBIT is uh, the big box here in the center. We have a calorimeter and several other spectrometers like a um, solid state detector, grading spectrometers, and crystal spectrometers. Um, EBITs are very well uh, suited to do atomic physics measurements. Uh, you get an um, electrostatic trap where you can breed your ions and you use a monoenergetic or quasi monoenergetic electron beam to excite and ionize those ions. Um, we have um, about a 20 to 50 EV um, energy resolution on our beam. It's only about 60 micrometers wide. Um, we can measure anywhere between 100 EV and over 100 keV. We operate in the um, coronal density limit, and then uh, we can actually also use unique uh, operating mechanisms where we basically sweep the electron energy so that we can simulate as a time average other um, uh, energy distributions. Um, our Virco spectrometer right now is the ECS. This is the calorimeter here, which is very similar to um, the Hitomi SXS and um, CRISM Resolve. Um, in Livermore, we also um, collaborate with a group in Heidelberg um, at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Nuclear Physics, um, who also operate EBITs. Um, in the collaboration we work with, um, mostly we take an EBIT, which you can see over here with the electron gun, um, the trap region, and we take those to uh, synchrotron experiments where we then use a photon beam to shoot that, shoot that into the trap and resonantly excite the ions into the, in the trap with the uh, photon beam. Um, we keep the direct excitation from collisional excitation um, background low by keeping the um, electron beam in the EBIT below the excitation threshold so that, um, as you can see on the right-hand side, all the background is going to be below the resonance excitation of the photon beams. And those uh, synchrotron beamlines we go to have a very high photon energy resolution, so we can um, produce like very um, high resolution spectra and with um, energies on the uh, with an accuracy on the order of uh, milli EV. Uh, Chintan will show you um, a, one example of those measurements in more detail. Um, I'll just uh, mention a couple of them. So um, we'll just go through a few um, problems that uh, were seen in, in space observations um, and how Lab Astro was able to contribute to um, resolve those issues. 
Uh, we'll start with one of my favorites. That was also my first one. Um, on the left hand side, you can see an image of or an artist's impression of uh, the high mass X ray binary signal 6 1 um, with the supermassive um, star on the left hand side and the accreting black hole on the right. Uh, the supermassive star has strong stellar winds that are essentially focused onto the black hole, but that stellar wind is um, clumpy and essentially has some clouds in it. And as these clouds pass our line of sight for observation, um, you can see strong dips in the X-ray light curves. But not only the intensity um, of the observed light changes, but actually the spectral content changes quite a bit um, as we go through those dips. And um, you can see that especially well in the silicon region, which you can see plotted on the right-hand side, where in the non-dip portions, you see that there's mostly hydrogen-like limine alpha and helium-like W lines. And the deeper you go into the dip and the stronger the absorption becomes, the more of the lower charge states you can see down here. Um, up here, you can see reference energies that were available at the time. As you can see, um, they would indicate that the Doppler shift for each of those ions differs from each other, um, which then begs the question, either the um, gas is doing something funky uh, and instead of like traveling as individual clumps or something is wrong with the atomic physics here. <laughs> And um, the indication was that it's the atomic physics because um, calculations of transition energies um, for, for those can vary at 2 to 5 EV, which corresponds to several hundred kilometers per second, which is more than the Doppler shifts that we expected in the system to begin with. So we did some measurements at the um, EBIT in Livermore, which you can see down here. And of course, it turned out that all of those ions travel at the same Doppler shift. <laughs> Um, that's actually a fairly widespread problem. You can see at the top uh, silicon spectrum and emission from VLAX1. Um, it's not uh, isolated to silicon. You can see that, for example, in neon, magnesium, and sulfur as well. You would see it in iron, but for the most part, we haven't really had the resolution to, um, to see that very well um, so far. And until um, a few years ago, Often the k shell transitions of the lower charge states, meaning three and more electrons, weren't even necessarily included in the databases at all. Nowadays, they are included, but to a large degree, the energies for their transitions need to still be benchmarked. Um, with the calorimeter measurement at EBIT, we um, got about uh, we got better than half an EV accuracies on the line centers for the strong lines and for the weak lines and the wings. Um, we still are better than one EV, uh, which is less than 100 kilometers per second. And the comparison with the fax spectra, which is the calculations you see in colored under the spectrum, um, are that those calculations are good to about one EV. But of course, for Athena, um, Arcus, Lem, and so on, we need to do better. Um, and one way you can do better is by increasing your spectral resolution. So here, um, I will make both a case for um, why you need higher spectral resolution um, and what the crystal spectra, uh, spectra can do for you. So in red, you can see the um, crystal spectrum, sorry, the calorimeter spectrum. I also convolved that with 150 EV resolution just to demonstrate um, how much information you lose with a um, solid state detector. And then you can see in black the crystal spectrum here um, and then zoomed into here at the bottom. Um, one problem is the crystal spectra, other than that the effective uh, areas are low and therefore the uh, measurements take longer, is that you have a limited um, wavelength band that you can observe. So the the red, the calorimeter spectrum in red, that is all what you see in, and more, I just cut it down actually, um, in, in a single spectrometer setting. While um, if I wanted to see more or different lines with the crystal spectrometer, I would have to do this in multiple settings and move it. So this is the entire band that the crystal spectrometer had. Um, the um, line center accuracy for that crystal spectrometer was um, better than 0.2 EV. Um, the resolution was about um, 0.5 EV. And you can see that the strong lines are very well reproduced with the calorimeter measurement. But for the even lower charge states, it can get a bit messy when you have a lot of lines in here. Um, this here is the carbon-like um, sulfur. And we look at that a little bit more in detail. You can see indicated up here the full width half maximum of the 
ECS model, um, and then the crystal spectrum in black with its fit, and then in, in the sticks are the uh, fact calculations that we use to identify the lines. And as you can see, it gets actually even harder to identify uh, lines once your um, spectrometer resolution exceeds the accuracy of the atomic physics calculation, um, because, you know, um, just gets messy down here. Um, then I mentioned you would be able to see uh, these lower charge states also for iron. And then, of course, um, while the K-alpha transitions um, have uh, largely not been benchmarked, um, this, the situation is even worse for the um, K-beta and um, larger N um, spectra because um, they're generally weaker with a crystal spectrometer. You would take even longer and more settings to um, see all the lines. Um, the calorimeter measurements have not widely been available yet. Um, so those lines are even less well known, at least how good their accuracy is or um, how big their uncertainties are. Um, here you can see a Chandra ATTG observation from GRS 1915 going into its obscured state. And you can see that um, there's a lot of lower charge states going on. This is the iron complex in a little bit more detail over here where this is W and Lyman alpha, and then the lower charge states are these. And you can see that um, you see a lot of the, um, or you start to see a lot of the K-beta transitions over here. And I have seen a CRISM simulation where those will come out even stronger. So it's um, quite about time to actually um, look at these and, um, so we started with sulfur measurements, which is um, a measurement that um, Roy Rahin at uh, Goddard is currently working at analyzing. And um, over here, you see the K-alpha uh, measurements, uh, sorry, the K-alpha lines and the helium-like and the hydrogen-like Rydberg series. But in the center, you can see that there's uh, other lines showing up. And if you put that on a log plot, you can see that there's uh, quite a bit going on. Um, at the bottom, you see a fact calculation. You see that that isn't far off. And if you compare the line centers that we measured from that spectrum with our fact calculations, um, then fact still, again, is um, good about uh, 1 EV. Um, the uh, lithium-like lines are available in Chianti. They're actually there doing a little bit better than our calculation. And then atom DB has more of the charge states, like most of the lower charge states are over here. And then for lithium, like we see more of the Rydberg series since it's stronger. Um, and um, atom DB needs a little bit of a larger correction here, um, which is, I haven't told Adam this yet, but we will be working on that together. Um, we also have an iron spectrum um, for that, which is actually belongs to a different measurement that wasn't originally an energy measurement. But since you have the helium like Rydberg series going through that spectrum, it's basically self calibrating. Um, the analysis of this or the detailed analysis of this is pending, but you can see the helium beta line here and then all the lower charge states, including down below neon like. I just don't have calculations below sodium like. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of, go of stuff going on here too. So one of the measurements that we are actually also working on is um, one going to the um, synchrotron at uh, Petra Daisy in Germany. Um, Jakob Stierhof uh, in Erlangen is uh, leading the analysis on this project. And you can see that um, on the left-hand side, K-alpha transitions um, of uh, air shell ions. Um, you can see there's really a lot of detail and a lot of high resolution going on here. You can see a lot of the lines. Um, on the right-hand side, you see K-beta spectra of um, fluorine-like over here, if you can still see that. Yeah. Uh, Neon-like and lower charge state. And the, the way we are um, able to disentangle the different charge states and resolve more of those lines is by selectively breeding different ions in the EBIT. So we can vary the electron beam energy and the EBIT conditions to make sure that um, the spectra change. So we actually also have spectra where the charge balance is even lower and these lines become stronger. Um, one issue that we have with this measurement, but that we plan to remedy with a future measurement is that the beam line wasn't particularly stable, but we have ways to um, fix that issue in a, in a future measurement. Um, then of course, LETG is, um, becoming uh, is, is kind of abandoned and not get doesn't get a lot of attention, but the EUV lines um, need help too. 
Um, so on the, on the left hand side, you can see that uh, Chianti version 7 and Chianti version 8, the line content for um, iron 9 uh, in the EUV range around 170 angstrom changes a lot. And you see FAC and MRMP calculations by Peter Beiersdorfer at the bottom, which look quite a bit different again. So here lab measurements are needed, which you can see on the right hand side where you carefully step through the EBIT conditions. And as the lines change, you can identify those with different charge states and you can of course measure their wavelengths. Um, one important um, measurement that came out of a Chandra problem actually was that um, in Chandra observations, the locations of the um, photoionization spectra um, were uh, not matching up at all with uh, the theory and the measurements from the lab before, uh, which would have indicated that atomic oxygen, even if you um, average that over several lines of sight through the galaxy, would be traveling at several hundred or a few hundred uh, kilometers per second. Um, which is unexpected and also would have been the only um, atom where that is the case. Everything else was more at rest. Um, <laughs> right. um, so um, a project led by Maurice Leutenegger, uh, we went to the Bessie beamline in Berlin, uh, where we put a EBIT and a, um, a gas chamber in line so that while we were scanning the photon energy, of the beam line, we would excite helium-like series in the EBIT, which then, since the reference wavelengths are well known for those, um, calibrates the photon energy of the beam, while at the same time in the gas chamber, we see the photoionization spectrum of oxygen two, uh, molecular oxygen. Um, and then you can see here that um, the location of the, the line centroids that we measured relative to the known values is about half an EV off which um, that spectrum was originally used to um, calibrate the lab measurements that didn't agree with the Chandra observations. Um, and by correcting for, for that offset in the calibration spectrum, actually the Chandra problem goes away. Um, so that's one of those issues where that have been bugging people for a long time and then Lab Astro was able to resolve that issue. Um, while line centers are a big problem, that um, needs attention. Uh, of course, there are other atomic physics parameters uh, that are important. Um, and those go into like line strength and line ratios. So here um, you can see an, a measurement um, for dielectronic satellite strengths. Um, this is for neon-like iron, where on the left-hand side, you can see the photon energy in the bottom, um, you can see the electron beam energy. Um, as we talked about before, we can actually sweep the electron energy. So you can see that below excitation threshold here, we excite the dr lines. They get closer and closer in um, line energy to the direct excitation line, like in this case, 3C and 3D. You can also see that the 3F and um, 3G lines don't have sizable contributions from dr lines. And by measuring the relative uh, strength of these dr lines to the direct excitation line, you can um, calibrate a temperature diagnostic. And so we go back to a Chandra um, observation, in this case of a capella, where you can see the neon-like iron 3C line over here. And you see there's a sizable um, satellite contribution here. If you put that on a log plot in uh, blue, in dark blue, you see the contribution from all the dr lines. And the dashed light blue lines are just the n equals four contributions that you can actually resolve a little bit better here. And by um, correcting the uh, temperature versus line ratio curve from theory in red with the EBIT ratios, you can get a very accurate um, temperature diagnostic um, where even with a few photons, you get a 5% um, uncertainty on the, uh, on the temperature um, with uh, dominated by counting statistics. Um, other ways that we can uh, work on, on line intensities is by measuring the direct excitation cross sections. The way we do those at EBIT is by normalizing to the radiative recombination lines um, whose cross sections are well known. Um, on the left hand side, you see the sulfur K alpha spectrum again, on the right in, in a relatively low charge balance. On the right hand side, you see 
the um, radiative recombination into different ions. Um, the radiative recombination gives us the relative charge balance. And then um, if you look at the cross-section results, you can see on the left-hand side for line W that line W is largely um, insensitive to the charge balance. But on the right-hand side, you can see for the forbidden line, um, the direct excitation cross-section is down here in blue. Um, all our measurements up here are up here. Uh, you can see that in black and in red, the two um, sets of measurements actually differ in, cross, in effective cross-section quite a bit. The reason for that is um, the charge balance, where black has about an equal contribution from lithium-like and helium-like, while red is uh, largely dominated by helium-like. The difference is because uh, line C has a strong collisional ionization um, channel to, for, for exciting the up or populating the upper level. Um, and by, by measuring as a function of charge state, we can actually disentangle the contributions um, for those. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the um, capability of sweeping the beam energy. Um, this one has died a bit a little bit, but um, you can see a, a pattern here. That's basically the beam energy as a function of time, where we just sweep from the um, higher energy to a lower energy and back up. Um, several times so that on a time average you get a max value distribution over here. That technique was demonstrated and um, introduced by Daniel Seven in 2000. Um, and on the right hand side you can see that's the same sh the shape that you should have seen over here. Um, that we can actually extend um, that capability to basically any uh, electron energy distribution. Um, in this case a kappa distribution that was introduced by uh, Makoto Savada um, to our suit of uh, experiments. Um, it also turns out that the ionization time scales in an EBIT and a supernova remnant are about the same. Um, so we can, <laughs> it's funny, right? <laughs> um, it's uh, nice how things sometimes work out. <laughs> um, anyway, so we can actually uh, measure supernova remnant uh, relevant uh, conditions very nicely. Um, First, I just wanted to show you um, what, what the sweep looks like if you do the measured photon energy as a function of sweep phase, which translates to photon energy. You'll recognize here in the radiative recombination, which is the sum of the ionization potential and the electron energy, um, the sweep shape again. Um, you'll see that there's uh, the dr lines separately, and then as we go to higher energies, we see the direct excitation. There's some emission below excitation threshold as well, which is coming from uh, radiative and charge exchange cascades. And so we can look at the line ratios for this uh, simulated plasma um, as a compound, just in the, the compound spectrum, or we can actually also um, look at individual uh, contributions separately. So on the right-hand side, as an example, you see the helium-like KLL, the uh, hydrogen-like KLL, and the spectrum from the cascades. Uh, we've used the Maxwellian uh, simulator for a few experiments. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the 3.5 keV line. <laughs> um, that's one of those example where, examples where it's very important that your uh, plasma models are accurate. Um, so we use the Maxwellian sweeper um, to measure um, the spectrum uh, for argon and EBIT, and we found that for the um, dr to the healing like k-beta line, the um, flux in the model is underpredicted by about a factor of two, but that is not sufficient to explain um, this bump in the spectrum. Um, other measurements um, in, with that in mind have been done where, um, oops, um, where possible explanations from um, sulfur charge exchange um, exciting higher end levels and, and sulfur um, have been explored. Um, one other example was the uh, the helium-like iron spectrum that was also measured with a uh, with the Maxwellian sweeper, which was crucial to um, calibrate the Perseus spectrum um, observed with Hitomi SXS. The SXS at the time was not in thermal equilibrium yet and, the, and not fully calibrated in space. So having a reference spectrum or a well-known re reference spectrum in a um, in a controlled laboratory environment um, allowed uh, the calibration team to 
um, really get the uh, the energy scale on the Hitomi spectrum um, fixed. And then we've heard earlier today that um, despite their large extent, um, high resolution uh, um, or grading observations of supernova remnants um, are a thing. Um, they usually have uh, non-equilibrium plasma conditions. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, as an example, the Tycho supernova remnant compared with the W49b, where Tycho has a, is an ionizing plasma that is a low charge balance, and um, W49b has, is a recombining plasma that has a lot of high charge states and the corresponding lines in it. If you model these spectra with any eye uh, models, you can see that for the helium-like series in the higher end states, the plasma is um, uh, under, uh, the, the line strings are under predicted. So we went to EBIT and that's um, still this analysis ongoing as well. But at EBIT, we can create such a recombining and ionizing plasma. The recombining plasma by just breathing to a high charge state first and then switching to a sweep with a low temperature. And you can see from the argon Lyman alpha over W ratio that the energy, uh, the, the line ratio and therefore the um, charge balance is really going down over time. And for an ionizing plasma, we just inject neutrals into the trap and start sweeping right away. And you can see the charge balance increasing over time. And then at the bottom, you just see um, the spectral content compared from like the earlier parts of the sweeps versus the later parts of the sweeps. And so we can um, look at the, the time uh, resolved changes of those NEI plasmas. Um, and then, of course, we also did um, kappa distribution measurements. Um, you see on the left hand side a collisional ionization equilibrium uh, measurement in blue. Um, in ionizing conditions in black and with ionizing conditions um, with a kappa distribution of two in red and normalized to the W line. And you can see how the um, ionizing uh, conditions have a lower charge balance compared to the uh, equilibrium. But then the kappa distribution is actually increasing um, the charge balance a little bit again as well. Um, the charge balance you can see especially well at the Lyman series over here. And then if you normalize um, the dr to the Lyman alpha line um, to the dr lines, you can see that the dr to direct excitation ratio doesn't change between the equilibrium and the ionization uh, case because um, they are coming from the same parent ion. So the charge balance doesn't influence that line ratio, but the kappa distribution, which gives you a high energy tail, actually um, then boosts you the uh, the direct excitation line for Lyman alpha. Um, and so I think I'll just um, keep the conclusions and the outlook up. Um, in principle, um, lab astro is going to be even more important um, when gradings with higher efficiency and higher resolution become available and with the calorimeter emissions that are coming up. Um, we have many of the tools for lab astro available that we need They just for both theory and experiments. They just need to be used. Um, and uh, there's other challenges that exist be, uh, beyond the shown examples, which include charge exchange that I um, didn't show, um, and dust, which has been mentioned in the previous session. Um, and so if you have any problems with your spectra and interpreting them, come talk to the Lab Astro community. We are here to help you. <laughs> No worries. Questions for Natalie? Hi, uh, I'm one of the wind people in black holes. Okay. So of course I was very interested in the JRS 1915 spectra you showed. Uh, I can tell you there are at least three other sources with such issues in several spectra. And if you also go to time result spectroscopy, it gets even worse. So what a, my first question is, how much do you expect the K beta new results to change the speeds that we would be measuring? We would be like, would it be noticeable with Prism? Would it be like I don't know, a few hundreds of kilometers per second, a few tens? Um, or... I don't know the speeds that you are measuring right now. I have to admit. So one but... of the questions is: Do we get zero speed for some of the components, or do we get negative speeds, which would mean we have redshifted wind claims, which would be very interesting to see, um, like in falling material? And right. it's really hard to distinguish in falling material at the moment from just a different ionization structure. Uh, right. Um, 
the uh, spectral resolution is going to help with that because then you can distinguish charged uh, yeah. charge states from each other. Um, the K alpha lines are on the order of one to two EV, I think, for iron currently. Um, I would have to do the math to tell you what speed no, that is that, for that, six point seven. <laughs> extremely low, so that's good um, for us. right. Um, the K beta lines are probably not super far off. Um, for the K-beta lines at Iron, at least, there had been some issue. Uh, Adam will probably remember who asked him <laughs> um, about that specifically, but the original question there was, um, are the lines 20 EV off or are they pretty close? And um, currently, we think they are pretty close based on what we've seen, but we have to finish the analysis on those. Okay. Second question, if I may. Uh, there's also... Uh, talk about the uh, Chrome 24K beta around 7.03 kev, which is very interesting because it would allow us maybe to distinguish uh, thermal driving from MHG driving for some already existing spectra. And so uh, I, I don't think you've mentioned that in the talk. Like you've seen, you, you've shown that at 1.1 plot below 7 kev and another one above 7.1. Did you look at, I mean, I don't know if this line is up to date in terms of measurements. Chromium, have you like, uh, I that. am not aware of measurements of the chromium K beta lines. Okay. Um, All right. So, but you know, we are in principle, as time and funding allows, of course, going through the list. Okay. So this would be also very important. Thanks. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, some online. Uh, there's a comment from the head Bahar. Natalie, we published K-cell absorption of L-shell ions for essentially all abundant elements a long time ago and detected them in many as physical spectra. Even benchmarking is still super important. Correct. Um, based on the year on that citation, I think we did mention that in the sil uh, silicon paper. <laughs> we did compare to the, the silicon and the sulfur lines in that paper. Um, we haven't uh, benchmarked the other lines in there. Okay, and another uh, question. Do you think the luminosity of EBIT would be sufficient for a double crystal measurement for reference-free measurements? Um, that'll be line dependent, I think, um, and exposure time dependent. Um, for the, uh, the lower C elements, especially around like neon, um, we can be very bright um, for um, iron K, um, our measurements are typically relatively low luminosity. Um, so for iron, we'd have to do some math for the lower elements. I think we should be able to do that. But of course, we'd have to confirm before we start the measurement. Okay, uh, one more question. How well do we know the calibration of molecular oxygen? Uh, how well do we know the calibration? Yeah. Uh, we measured it. So you, you also, okay. Right, so um, we measured the molecular oxygen Rydberg series um, to me uh, to calibrate it against the helium-like um, reference energies from that that we produced with EBIT, um, because there was question about the um, accuracy of the original lines. Um, one problem with the o molecular oxygen was that actually a lot of experiment used it as a calibration reference. Yeah. Um, if I remember the details correctly, one of the issues with that calibration line was that um, they're basically based on EELS measurements and um, their calibration originally was based on a multimeter that was calibrated around 2 kV and then assumed to be linear down to 500 EV. <laughs> so um, in that light, uh, half a EV is actually pretty good. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, thank you, Natalie. Oh, right. Uh, next, we have new measurements resolve PS physical iron 17 problem. Shimpin Shah, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I'll uh, tell you when 10 minutes is up. Um, yes. Finish the question. Hopefully, I'll. <laughs> So, um, uh, hello everyone. I think my talk is going to be slightly simpler because I'm going to talk about only two lines. 
in iron 16 plus which is called 3c and 3d uh, and i think many of those things are covered already in natalie's talk so i won't go into details but of course that the line ratios are important for the plasma diagnostics and the particular issue with this uh, two lines uh, uh, specifically that the ratio of these two lines weren't matching for the atomic theory for a long time so <clears throat> this was the conclusion kind of in a way in the second slide but this is the 3c 3d ratio measured so far from the tokamak ebit and different observations and on the top in the gray you can see all the calculations and model value and you can see the systematic shift between the line ratio and uh, this was the question from a long time that what is causing this difference between the calculations and the and the observations and the measurements so i think in natalie's talk she already mentioned about the ebits and so i don't have to cover but mostly in a simpler uh, ebit spectroscopy which she mentioned already that we use the electron beam to actually drive different transitions electron impact ionization excitation recombination you can measure all of these processes with x-ray detector which can measure also it which can count the photon as well as measure the wavelength we do it slightly different where we use ebit only to produce and trap the ions of our choice and then use the laser to photo excite those ions and in our case this is x-ray laser because we want to do uh, x-ray spectroscopy and the advantage here is that all of the background which you can see in this small data and all of the background coming from the different atomic processes will vanish if you use the purely photonic excitation so this was the trick that we have used and we went uh, almost a decade before to lcls this was the first free electron laser again i will not go into details but you can see this is our somewhat portable ebit consisting of four ton of stainless steel but uh, you can see the photon beam from uh, uh, free electron laser comes from this side this is the central trap region and uh, where we photo excite the ions and all this different detector including a micro calorimeter observed uh, the fluorescence from the trapped ion and the measurement technique was simple as i mentioned that we trap iron 16 plus ion uh, using an ebit and then we uh, shoot the x-ray laser and select the wavelength using this monochromator and focusing mirror uh, to excite different transition and this is what you can see at the bottom which is a fluorescence photon energy uh, observed by this uh, x-ray detector for an example uh, uh, note that this x-ray detector do not require any kind of resolution it just uh, uh, used to uh, count uh, the um, photons basically because the re energy resolution comes from this monochromator okay so that's why you can resolve very clearly the line 3d and line 3c and as i mentioned these are like purely photonic excitation that means the excitation rates are proportional to the oscillator strength so if you take the line ratio which would be proportional to the oscillator strength ratio this is the value we got which was 2.6 plus or minus 0.23 which was in agreement with most of the observations and the measurement available at that time and still disagreeing with the calculations which were spread it from 3.5 to 5.0 for the line ratio. So we thought that the, the, the real issue with this discrepancy that we see in the collisional strength of 3C and 3D comes from the oscillator strength. And the atomic theory has to update the oscillator strength value or find a way to calculate it. Uh, however, there were some issues which come up after that, which was to, in 2012 and later on. Uh, and the two issues, uh, particularly where that uh, particularly comes from using an X-ray free electron laser because these are like free electron laser has huge intensities of the X-ray pulse, femtosecond X-ray pulses and they can go up to 10 to the 12, 10 to the 14 uh, volts per uh, square centimeter and within this femtosecond level depending on the lifetime of the transition there is not an enough time that the excited state population for for an example 3C or 3D will reach to a equilibrium and uh, that you can see if you use the 20 femtosecond pulse or 500 femtosecond the 3c and 3d line ratio would be different and the similar issue is that uh, in the ebit as also mentioned in natalie's talk that we have a distribution of the charge state we can choose which should be the dominant one so we can choose that iron 16 plus should be the dominant one but also it has a distribution of the lower charge state so the iron 15 plus always coexist with 16 plus and there is a strong autoionization channel which was always feeding 
this line 3D. And those difference between line C and line 3D uh, was close to one EV uh, that we knew only from the theoretical calculations. So to mitigate both of this problem, we went to synchrotron in 2018. Uh, meanwhile, we also developed uh, another EBIT, which is more like, which is smaller, let's say, and easy to transport. So this is a smaller tabletop EBIT, which could actually fit on this table. Uh, uh, and it's a permanent magnet EBIT. It can produce up to close to one Tesla magnetic field. Uh, and uh, it can also produce the iron up to iron 24 plus, which is uh, good for the astrophysical, uh, astrophysical um, uh, relevance. So and the another, the first thing is that the, we use the synchrotron photon beam. Um, it is like, I think seven or eight orders of magnitude less in the intensities, first of all, and also the pulse duration for the synchrotrons are in nanosecond instead of femtosecond. So uh, the ions have enough time to reach to the equilibrium. So, and the second thing is that using a synchrotron allows us to improve the resolution. So this is an example. This is where we were in 2012 compared to high energy transmission grating. So you have one EV full width half maxima at 825. And then we improved by roughly eight, eight to 10 times. And there you can see very sharp 3C line. But now you can see that line C from iron 15 plus and the 16 plus 3D are separated actually. And this helped a lot to track this population transfer. The measurement was the same uh, as also mentioned previously. So we see that now the theory which was predicting one EV difference between line C and 3D were actually 154 milli electron volt apart. But this was good for us because we can fit clearly separately line C and 3D and take the line ratio. So this was our result. So we went from 2.6 to 3.1. We improved uh, our uncertainty. The calculations were the same. The lowest one was 3.5 and our results were still phi sigma away. So this was still like kind of, uh, uh, we, we thought that it's an experimental improvement, but not the solution to the problem. So uh, what we wanted to do for the for a long time that we wanted to measure the 3C and 3D individually rather than measuring their line ratio, because line ratio will not tell you what's the problem, whether it's in 3C or 3D. And this was our existing setup usually we used and we improved the setup uh, with a uh, different diagnostics. I won't go into details, but that led to an improvement in the signal to noise. Signal to noise were improved by 800 times, basically. What you can see here on the top, again, for the comparison for 3C, this was the data that we observed previously, the, the data which I just showed. And then we improved from 2018 to 2020, uh, 2020 uh, this uh, violet color curve. And uh, we improved almost 800, also improved the resolution by two times. So we went from 10,000 resolving power to 20,000 resolving power. And with that, basically you started seeing this strong wings, which comes from the Lorentzian component of the line, which stems from the finite lifetime of a transition. And you can clearly see this difference between if you fit a Gauss model or the Foyt model. And uh, this was the critical part, which, which were the missing counts. Uh, and just to compare, how this uh, resolution and the Lorentz in wing could kind of changes your 3C, 3D line ratio. So on the top, you can see at the resolving power 8,000, you still have this overlap between line C and 3D and which we reduced to at 20,000 to 1% from 5% to 1%. And you can also see at li for line 3C, if you are at lower resolution, if you are just fitting the Gaussian, you only detect 94% of the photon and the 6% photons are buried in this uh, Lorentzian wing. And usually like they are like buried quite long in the background and you usually subtract the background, which reduces the overall intensity for the 3C. And with that, basically with all of this improvement, almost of a decade, we were able to get the value, which were matching with most of the latest calculation from last two decades. It disagreed. Now it can you can see that it disagreed with the astrophysical data of the tokamak, and I think this are uh, this is mostly due to this line C, which were like it's not possible to resolve at the current resolving power that we have with the telescope and the laboratory measurement. Uh, so we have now a 3.51 line ratio, which agrees with the theory. So the oscillator strengths were correct. Uh, 
Uh, as I mentioned that we can also measure the individual oscillator strength because of this Lorentzian component. So we'll not uh, go into details, but well, this is the li uh, natural line width of uh, line 3C and 3D, which agrees very well with the theory. And as well as you can convert the uh, natural line width into the oscillator strength, and it gives also um, a pretty good answer and agreement with the theory. So over almost a decade of improvement um, in the experimental side, we, we are at the lowest uncertainty level, like at 0.5%. And we also did a lot of, uh, uh, like we also put a lot of efforts in the large scale configuration interaction calculation, which also now reached to a 0.5 level. 0.5% uh, uncertainty. So, and the absolute value of st oscillator strength agrees very well. What are the implications? Well, now we know that the, the, the oscillator strength, which is even more fundamental quantity than the collision strength is kind of the 3C, 3D oscillator strengths are correct. So maybe we have to look the collision strength problem once again uh, with the laboratory measurements. And just to tell you like how it looks like with the techniques of the EBIT and using the synchrotron, we reached to 20,000 in 2020. And now last year, we already reached to 50,000 close to. So this is the power of uh, uh, using the synchrotron and the EBIT. So here is an example. You can see oxygen six plus helium like one S and P transition. So these are like seven P to one S, eight P and so on. And at, for an example, you can see that at the line 731, we achieved the resolving power of 47,000, which is really good. And we can measure the lines, which are down to one milli electron volt. Uh, and this, are, this has a lot of implication also in the future to measure different lifetime for the resonance lines, and also to calibrate the synchrotron and the free electron laser beam lines. So at the end, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Questions? It's all perfectly clear. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Anything from on that work? If it takes 10 years for two lines. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's our prospects of getting right what, let's say, Arcos or Lem would observe? Well, it really depends on the level of accuracy that you want. I mean, we, we can now really measure with this technique lines down to one parts per or two parts per million accuracy. And uh, Natalie also showed many of the example. So really, if you want to do a bulk measurement, there is also a possibility. I think uh, she showed some of the example from our campaigns at Petra. Uh, and if you really, really care about two lines like we did for this two, then we can really go into details, like uh, really like beat the like resolving power and so on uh, and using different techniques to resolve any of the discrepancy. But to produce the bulk data, I think EBIT with the calorimeter setup or the crystal spectrometer is good enough. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Javier Garcia from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, X-ray deflection modeling in the era of high resolution spectroscopy. Yeah. Thank you. So I suspect I have way too many slides, so I'm going to go a little bit faster than usual. <laughs> Pay attention. This is all extremely important science. So what I want to do is really to give an overview of a few uh, science topics re re related to X-ray reflection spectroscopy, what I think will be um, useful in, in the era of high resolution X-ray spectroscopy um in the in the coming years so very briefly the, this is a cartoon picture i always show uh in in to, when we talk about reflection what we think is uh we have a, a powerful coronal emission non-thermal emission looks like a power law in x-rays uh you get some fraction of those photons directly to the observer another fraction shines into the disk those photons get reprocessed and they're going to come out differently 
no, no, as a power law, they come, they produce a uh, fluorescence emission. You see the iron K alpha and K beta lines there in green. They also produce absorption. You see, you see a lot of absorption edge, edges, um, like the one shown there. I don't see the mouse here, fortunately. All right. Um, and we also ha have this big bump, a high energy is called the Compton home because uh, of electron scattering. If the reflection occurs near the black hole or a, a compact object is going to be uh, distorted by relativistic effects. And this is uh, one of the things that have made this technique important because that means that it's, it's sensitive to where the, the, the reflection is produced, what is the inner edge of the Christian disk. And the position of the inner edge of the disk is uh, a function of the spin of the black hole in the case that you're talking about a black hole within a Christian disk. So we use the, the, the formation of the um, reflection spectra to uh, est estimate the spin of the black hole. And another important thing is that this is a technique, this kind of mass, uh, it doesn't depend on the mass. So you can apply it to neutron stars, stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes uh, alike with some considerations. Uh, so it's fun to think that the first detection of, of a broad iron line came in 95 with uh, the first CCD detector that was high resolution back then, right? Um, and and was, they were able to see the asymmetry in the iron emission. And, you know, since then, uh, we can actually see at even lower resolution, we can see reflection if you have enough signal in very bright sources. For example, we have used RXT quite a lot uh, to see reflection features. Um, Newstar nowadays can do a much better job than RxD in a similar band, which is important because it covers all these um, features that are uh, relevant for X-ray reflection, but it still is at a limited resolution. And this is what we're looking now. Uh, I'm showing the simulation with the Athena, um, but Crescent very soon will deliver similar uh, resolution, um, not no at the same signal, but uh, it's going to be a similar resolution for bright sources. So this is this is going to allow us now to start looking into very small details of um, the properties of the matter that produces reflection, but also the properties of the creating object. <clears throat> and this is what the models look like today. This is reflection models produced with the silver code a while ago already, trying to match the resolution that we expect to see in the microcalorimeter. So. Um, you don't have to be an expert to realize that it's a, a huge complexity in, in the emission, in the reflection spectra. Um, mm -hmm. I have actually issues identifying all the lines in the model, which is kind of funny because you will expect that a model, you will know every line, but it's, it's actually not that mm -hmm. trivial. And, um, and there is a huge uh, diagnos diagnostic potential here. This is just a, a, a comparison with previous, the previous uh, generation of uh, reflection models that we had, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so one aspect of reflection that might be important is uh, the inclination of the system. The, the, the inclination will affect the amount of relativistic blurring you see, especially affects the blue side of the iron line. Um, this is an example of a black hole binary called um, XTEJ1550. Uh, we, we observed, we, we took observation archival data in a very bright moment of the source, broadband spectroscopy, we apply uh, reflection models, including all the all the typical components. So it has non-thermal emission, it has disk emission and reflection both from far away and close to the black hole. This works perfectly well. We fitted a, a multitude of, of different model components. And every time we did this, the inclination always came out to be around 40 degrees, which was surprising because this is supposed to be uh, a much higher inclination source. So this suggests something like, well, people like to talk about misalignment of the inner accretion flow. Um, in this particular case, it's kind of a funny thing because it's, it's quite a big misalignment. It's about 30 degrees, um, which is kind of difficult to explain. It will also mean that the, that the spin of the black hole will be misaligned with respect to the jet, which had been seen and, and measured at a, at a higher inclination. So this is kind of difficult. Um, so we think that a possibility is that you have obscuration of the central region by the disk itself. The fact that there's a high inclination source means that you're likely, if, if there's some meaningful scale high in your outer accretion disk, it will tend to block some of the um, innermost um, reflected emission. 
and uh, simulations show that actually this um, this what it will do is would affect mostly the flux that you observe on the blue side of the iron line, kind of mimicking what you will see at a different inclination. So this is something that we can actually test well only if we have enough resolution to actually pinpoint the details of the of the iron emission. And um, just as, as a comment, it, it is extremely relevant now because of the X-ray polarization measurements from IXPE, we're getting different measurements for different sources in which sometimes the inclinations don't quite come um, what you expect. In the case of SIGX1, for example, the orbital inclination has been measured very well to something like 27 degrees. And in, um, in order to explain the polarization degree that we see with IXPE, which is about 4%, almost every model requires a higher inclination, something like 45 degrees. So this is just an example of where reflection spectroscopy could actually provide that extra um, insight on what really is happening with the inner accretion flow in terms of the viewing angle. Another uh, interesting case is if you go to extreme situation, a super Eddington accretion, you expect the accretion flow to be puffed up. The, the disk doesn't, it's not a thin disk anymore, and it could create like a funnel structure. And this particular geometry has been uh, um, invoked to explain observations of jaded uh, TDEs, tidal disrupt disruption events, where there are claims of um, iron lines emitted. And the, what I'm showing here is a cartoon and a Monte Carlo model produced by Jane Dai and um, her student, Si Jan Sang uh, in Hong Kong University, where they're, they're, they're uh, posting the, a picture of a uh, coronal emission centrally located close to the black hole. And this phonal geometry is likely to produce multiple reflection. You reflect once, but then that reflect the component goes again to the other side of the disk, reflects it, reflects again. And what you're gonna find is you're gonna see peaks of reflected emission, of iron emission, blue and red shift that are different places because this this um in this funnel, what you have is really a relativistic outflow. Um, so actually, uh, we start paying attention to this particular model because in another binary, this is not a TDE, it's just a black hole binary for you 1543. Uh, in the last albers, it went really bright. It went close to nine crap um, at some point. And when we look at the details of the iron emission, it would, we're having issues fitting that, uh, with, uh, fitting the Neustar data. The structure is kind of different. It kind of looked like it has two peaks and we couldn't quite fit it well, perfectly well with the models we have now. So we're wondering if this sort of situation will um, allow us to fit it. Of course, we need higher resolution to confirm this hypothesis. And this is a, a simulation where, for example, Chrism will, will do for only 10 kiloseconds for a much lower flux, a 10 milligram um, source. Uh, so, so we're excited about those, these kind of possibilities, testing this, um, these ideas. We have recently produced models for neutron stars because, as I said at the beginning, you can have reflection for uh, even compact objects like neutron stars. Uh, in this case, it's important because you're testing, you're trying to measure where the disk ends, uh, just like what you do in black holes, with the difference that in, in neutron stars, uh, the disk will is likely to extend all the way to the uh, surface of the neutron star or to the boundary layer. And this can give you then uh, upper limit in the radius of the neutron star, which is something very important. But neutron stars, the spin is uh, expected to be much lower than a black hole, which means the relativistic effects are going to be lower. Ergo, you need to, um, higher resolution will, will help you to uh, really uh, understand the line profile. So these are Athena simulations, um, what Athena will look uh, for, for measuring the, the radius of the neutron star. And I wanted just to show results from René Lotlam, who has been really the person um, leading all the analysis of several sources. This is SIGX2. And what it's showing here is the reflection spectroscopy um, constraints on the radius and mass of the neutron star compared with a multitude of models for the equation of a state. So combining reflection spectroscopy with gravitational wave measurements and pulsar timing measurements, uh, it, it's, it's, it's helping into narrowing down, discriminating between this, this great quantity of models. And you can imagine that a higher resolution, these constraints are gonna shrink even more. Um, we actually test 
these models against previous generations of reflection models. And it turns out that for NUSTAR data, they all do the same. They all look statistically equal. Uh, so you cannot tell them apart. But if you, again, if you look with CRISM, you can actually see that they're not identical. So this is once again, another example of uh, the importance of having high resolution data. Um, in the case of Maxi 1820, it's a relatively new black hole transient, uh, also very bright. We, we acquired many observations um, a couple of years ago, three years ago, and the Fabian later study in which during the transition to the surface day, we noticed um, sort of suspicious emission that cannot be quite well explained. His interpretation at the time was this could be emission from the plunging region. The plunging region is the region between where the disk and the innermost, the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit and the black hole. You don't expect much to come up from there, but actually if, this, if, the, if the black hole is spinning uh, not a high rate, that region is significantly larger. And he fitted this with a sequence of uh, thermal emission spectra that could explain perhaps that, that emission. About the same time, we were looking at a different archival data of back again, J1550, and in the surface state, we, we saw something similar. But in, the, in this case, it was more a bit more, although RXT has lower uh, spectral resolution, the signal, it was better. Um, and it looks like iron emission, but not Compton Hump. That was really difficult to fit with conventional models. So almost for fun, I said to my postdoc at the time, Riley Connors, who led this study, uh, let's try the, the reflection models from neutron stars, which use a black body as illumination, as continuum. And that actually worked out pretty well. And our interpretation of that is there is possibility that we're seeing returning radiation. This is thermal photons that are bent to, back to the disk by, um, by GR and produce reflection, not starting with a power law, but starting with a thermal kind of black body spectrum. And we kind of see this in other sources, since we published that study, other people have uh, found similar, similar results, but it's messy. You see here, this is GX339 in the surface day. I can make it work with a combination of reflection from uh, uh, the power law first, this emission and returning radiation. That is a mess. That is really no something that I can uh, be sure of what's going on. And I would love to see the same observation with Chris or Athena to see what's uh, what's happening. I think I'm running out of time. Uh, talking about the plunging region, we're, we're, we're thinking about it as well. And uh, typically you don't expect much radiation to come from it, or you don't expect much reflection because the material is supposed to be highly ionized. Any standard MHD model shows that the uh, density drops very rapidly inside the plunging region. However, in the case of a magnetized plasma, it's different. The simulations show that you maintain the density inside the ISCO. And in that case, you might produce additional reflection features from it. This is uh, work for, of a student of mine, uh, Jameson Dong, where it shows that you can have a different iron profile if you include radiation from the plunging region in the case of a mad um, accretion flow, a magnetically um, dominated accretion flow. But the differences are always going to be relatively small. So again, high resolution will, will tell us what's going on. We are about to release a new reflection, uh, a table of reflection models, including high density plasma effects. None of these effects have been included either into the photo ionization models like ESTAR, not in the, in the reflection. We're finding differences because of these effects that I don't have time to go over. If you're interested, please uh, find me, uh, I'll be happy to explain. But we're finding very, um, very important differences in the iron emission, uh, different densities, uh, very high densities. They're, they're brutal. They're very, very quite significant. Uh, so uh, soon there will be new models to, to show this. And this is what a chrism spectrum will look like for a only reflection, nothing else. This is kind of like idealistic or probably not real simulation, but it shows the power of high resolution in understanding all those little features that you see in, in a relatively high density reflection spectrum. Chrism will be launching about two, three weeks from now. So, you know, we're excited about it. Uh, almost half of the PV 
uh, observations category A are um, going to be done in combination with NUSTA, so that speaks for the need for broadband spectroscopy as well. And for the future, I just want to advertise we're working on this uh, probe class proposal, HEXPI, that is a simple way to put it, like an XMM and NUSTAR on steroids. So if you're interested to learn about it, just also find me or send me an email. I'll be happy to talk to you about that. And I stop here. Thank you. Okay, we're running a little over, but let's have one question. Yeah, Javier, thank you. Very interesting talk as usual. Uh, your explanation of the uh, low inclination of a certain binary system in terms of self-oscuration from the disk, uh, you stress that the measurements of inclination are pretty constant uh, with different uh, observations. But if there is a self-obscuration from the atmosphere of the disk, I would expect the atmosphere to be turbulent and this introducing a huge variability in your measurements of the apparent the inclination of the disk. So how you solve this kind of uh, contradiction? So so my answer is you're absolutely right. I I don't think I I meant to say that they are constant over time. Actually, it, it, we haven't done that study. That is that is a real study we have to do. What you mentioned is to look at the same source with good data over a, a full outburst, let's say, where you have changes in the accretion flow. For example, this scale high will also change. Or you might be able to see, for example, um, correlation with the with the um, with the orbital phase of the system. So that is that is the sort of a study that is needs to be done. But it just gets really complicated because when you're playing playing with fire here, you you have too many model components. That's what I'm advocating for high resolution to to really do this correctly. Okay, just just one more here. Yep. Um, so you show this beautiful um, high resolution version of of Relzo, uh models at the microcanonical resolution. Why didn't we need this for HETG? And are you testing it against HETG? Because obviously in the subbands we, we yeah have that kind of resolution. Yeah, absolutely. You you will you can do this. The, the, I, I, this is an unrealistic spectrum. I don't think there are sources in which we only see reflection with nothing else. Right. This has no GR, nothing nothing on it. For the iron K, there is there is not enough there is not enough area. That's I guess we're running out of time, but yeah. okay, let's talk later. Sorry. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, next. Uh <laughs> Ralph Balhausen, UMCT and NASA Goddard, Systematic Uncertainties of Atomic Data in Photoionization Modeling. All right, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uncertainties, but not uncertainties in, in data that we usually worry about, or, or maybe calibration, but... Um, but actually uncertainties that are inherent to, to the models that we use. And to start with, I want to um, remind you of the, of the famous Perseus cluster observation by Hitomi that I'm sure everyone has seen. And that was modeled with, dif with different plasma codes. And what happened was that people found, found different iron abundances uh, depending on on which, uh, which plasma code they used. And, and the differences were quite huge. And, and in particular, um, the differences were much higher than the statistical uncertainties on, uh, that you just got from, from your individual model fits. So from a purely statistical uh, point of view, if you, if you trusted your, um, your best fit values, you would find small uncertainties, but then if you compare to a different to a different atomic code, you would find a very different um, different answer. And and people who were experts on or are experts on these models were able to trace this down and and identified um, identified the reason of this discrepancy, and that was actually in in uh, in collisional um, collisional uh, rate coefficients that 
or in the atomic databases. Um, so this, this demonstrates clearly that we really need to understand the accuracy of our atomic data and of our atomic models um, in order to interpret these high quality um, quality spectra and make um, realistic or sound uncertainty estimates. Um, so like I said, there are like actually a bunch of um, plasma codes out that are widely used by the communities. Here are just a few and um, I highlighted those where um, um, there's an, a dedicated effort um, uh, to understand the effects of uncertainties actually in the underlying atomic data and how they propagate through it. So the problem with that is, is that, you know, these codes solve all these, um, all these um, rate equations. And uh, so, so uncertainties uh, don't propagate that easily. There are a number of processes that are coupled and nonlinear effects. So it's difficult to, to uh, predict if I, if I have an uncertainty in one of these processes, like how this will actually finally affect my final spectrum. But there are some efforts um, and for example, that are led by different groups of people. So for example, here, um, um, AtomDB um, discusses um, uh, atomic data uncertainties. And, and the way, or one way to treat this is basically by doing a Monte Carlo-like approach, which is very um, straightforward, I would say, in that you basically perturb your atomic data and then you repeat this um, calculation over and over again and basically see how your results spread. And then from the distribution of your results, you can, you can get a handle of what the uh, propagated uncertainty actually is. Um, so like I said, this is very straightforward, but of course this comes at a high computational overhead because you have to do these calculations over and over again. And um, the more um, um, uncertainties you introduce, the more uncertain, uh, like the more transitions you vary, the uh, more expensive it gets. Another approach that was um, proposed by Lee Gu from Esron. Um, focuses on observational data and the idea is basically that if you have a very high quality observation um, of an astrophysical source you can also treat this uh, in principle like a calibration um, source for your atomic model so the idea is um, the basic idea is simple say if i have if i have a spectrum that has say five silicon 10 lines and four of them fit very well and then the fifth one is a little bit off, then maybe this is an indication that there's something wrong with, with this particular line. Um, so in theory, this, this sounds simple, of course, but in reality, this is very difficult because you need to have enough confidence that your, that your um, global model is accurate enough that you can identify trend, uh, like uncertainties in individual, uh, in individual lines. Um, uh, so he used the um, um, HETG spectrum of uh, of Capella um, to say this effect on collisional uh, or coronal plasmas and implemented implemented this into spec CIE um, uh, model, and we did a similar um, uh, effort for for X star and warm ups and used. Uh, almost a megasecond of AGTG data of NGC 3783, basically as a calibration observation and fitted a um, multi-component photoionized absorber to it and then looked at if, like, how can we, if we allow individual lines to be modified or to perturb, how can we improve our fit? And then if we find a significant change in the line, treat this as a proxy for, for an uncertainty in the model. So basically, from this, we derive uncertainty estimates that we then implement into the extra database and then run the, the whole uh, spectral calculation uh, with, this, with this modified data. Um, so we implemented this into, into the extra warm-ups model that is, that is available, for example, in XPEC. And here you can basically see a simulated 
model spectrum and in black and in gray you see the uncertainty that is um is basically returned for these individual lines so unlike the statistical uncertainty that is here in red um the um yeah uncertainty that comes from the atomic data is then highest of course in the line uh, and in the line line cores um so we have this available at the moment in the development version so people can actually go and use it uh i i'll be honest with you this is computationally very expensive <laughs> so we are working on we are working on speeding things up but um using or applying this to actual observational data is is still challenging um it's really time consuming there is are at the moment also um um some limitations to interfacing so right now this only works in with basically with codes that accept the expect um local model uh interface but in principle this is just a technical limitation right now we're not like we can extend this and of course um we right now only use um HGTG data to derive our original uncertainty estimates on the database so um I expect with the uh, launch of Prism, we'll probably also have to revise um, our data um, base um, uh, further. So um, to sum up, so it, like we've seen already from our original example, um, uncertainties in atomic databases can be significant and can really affect spectral modeling and interpretation. Um, like we've also heard in previous talks um improving our atomic database uh our databases is an ongoing um effort that requires constant refinement of calculations and experiments and uh i would also advocate here for for uh thorough and systematic code and database comparisons so not just rely on one single um modeling um so i think i made up a little bit of time but yeah i'll leave up my conclusions and i'm happy to take questions thank you questions for rob your your estimates come from hetg data now if the hetg calibration is wrong <laughs> what's that going to do well <laughs> um or uncertain yes this will be so in principle if the i would say if the if there is an additional source of uncertainty then our estimated error on the atomic rate on the atomic rates will be larger than it really is in principle that shouldn't be a problem if i would say if the uncertainty is a bit larger than it really is i wouldn't be as worried as if it was smaller than it really is but yeah you may making an excellent point it is very difficult to disentangle calibration uh calibration uncertainties and atomic data uncertainties so if the line spread function was off a little bit or so this would be would be basically almost impossible to disentangle any other questions um uh, just to add on this um it's not only i mean there is the instrument calibration of course uncertainty but also especially in the second mo um, method you describe the modeling because you are assuming your modeling is perfect right that is an uh, um or the number of components you're fitting or i mean you are definitely overestimating i think your uncertainty no you this is yes no you're absolutely right um in principle you assume in this approach you assume that your model is perfect and that all remaining uncertainties are due to uncertainties in the atomic data which is certainly not true there are geometrical effects there are resonance get, there are a lot of other effects that also add up on this um um like i said it's an, ongo an, an ongoing effort we try to get a handle on this but there are also other ways to get estimates on the uncertainties you can compare different calculations you can compare to laboratory measurements this basically all needs to fit together but yeah this is an important caveat absolutely okay thank you, thank you.
Okay, uh, Adam Foster, Center for Astrophysics. Adam DB, updates for plasma models of recombination and charge exchange plasma. I always want to make a talk where the opening slide is a blank zoom screen, just to confuse somebody. It's already been edited. Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for letting me talk to you about AtomDB and what's going on. As you can see, there's been some minor edits to the title. Uh, the plan was to talk about recombination. We've been working on a new dielectronic recombination representation in our model and updates to charge exchange models. Those are still ongoing and uh, didn't get quite as far as we wanted to, but coming soon. So I'll talk to you about two other models we've been doing. I'll get that cursor right away. Uh, about resonance scattering, uncertainties on plasmas, and uh, a few other things. Uh, uncertainties in particular, uh, if you just heard about it. Um, okay, this side, what does X-ray astronomy need? As we know, we're all here for high-resolution X-ray spectrometer. It's the Chandra spectrum. We need lots of hydrogen helium-like ions. These are the ones we care about. Uh, the point I wanted to bring across here is that this is the Hitomi um, iron K spectrum. Uh, the red line is the FET to uh, the regular APEC model, and the black line is having taken out the four lines of helium-like iron. Take away those four lines, and you still have a lot of emission in there. That's from all of the lithium-like and beryllium-like iron um, in and the DR satellite lines and so on, all in this one short region of spectrum. And it comes to about 20 to 30 percent of the emission in that region. So you you cannot just you know concentrate on the four or five strongest lines and say we've got iron done. Let's all go home. I think everyone in this room probably knew that, but I like to re-emphasize that it is about 30% of the emission. It's not 5% or something. It's significant. And on the right, we're just showing that, you know, sort of different processes are required for each of these models. Uh, for resonance lines, this can be quite simple. It mostly relies on direct excitation. For a forbidden line, uh, another with, with the um, more complicated population process that can come from ionization, recombination, excitation to higher states and cascade, all of these things add up and you get a very complicated model. Um, okay, uh, this is just our PR slide. I just put this up. But what I want to point out here is that, first of all, we have the biggest circle. But secondly, um, the, uh, the things I've been working on here I'm going to concentrate on are these three in the middle over here. Uh, which are um, useful spectra uh, and integration into modeling tools. In particular, that means XSpec for us. And the fact that everything is open and people can poke holes in it and tell me that I've done it all wrong. Um, so this is our new resonance scattering model. This is work that's been done by Franca Chakrabarty, who joined us about a year ago. Um, so resonance scattering, I'm sure we all know at this point, it's a photon comes in, it gets absorbed, it gets emitted in a different direction. Sometimes that makes lines stronger, sometimes that makes lines weaker, depending on where exactly in your object you are looking. Um, we have implemented a simple bar model, which lets you do this, uh, assuming that you're looking through a bar of plasma uh, and the scattering happens. Uh, we've also implemented a more detailed model based on uh, the, um, the Shigeyama model, which is basically saying you've got concentric shells of plasma with emission into and out of the line of sight. Uh, this now exists as a thing that works in XBEC. You can now load this up and fit for effectively the line integral of the electron density, uh, and we can apply this. Um, this is the elliptical galaxy, NGC 4636, uh, with the RGS spectrum. On the top right, you see a fit uh, with initially in the in the blue, you see the broadened APEC model, and in the red, you see the new resonance scattering model. It's a global fit to the whole 
spectrum there. Um, and then at the bottom, we've zoomed in on this small region here for the iron 17 line, and you can see the resonance scattering has been modeled and it makes it improves the fit. Uh, crucially, the values we're getting out here are comparable to the literature values. So essentially, this is the model works. And it's a one, it's a one button click in XBEC. You don't need to you don't need to devise your own resonance scattering and radio transfer model for relatively simple systems. Obviously, if you're doing a very complicated system, you need to do a better job. The work still ongoing on this is to include the resonant enhancement for when you're looking off axis and then possibly to do some sequential shells. That's all coming in sort of the next iteration uh, once we get the first paper out so that Priyanka has some publications because she's been working on this for a while. Um, next thing, uncertainties. We were just hearing about those. It uh, turns out they're complicated. Who knew? Um, so we have taken, uh, well, we've heard about, we did the Monte Carlo approach. We've been doing a bit more of the work on the Monte Carlo approach um, amongst others for uh, estimating the effects of atomic data uncertainties. So this is taking the iron complex and the seven strongest lines in that region. And we've tried to estimate their uncertainties based on publish, published values for the transition probability and the collision strengths. So we just took these numbers. Uh, you can see here there is a 42% error on the collision strength for the forbidden line. I don't believe that's really 42%, but that is the difference between public calculations. So take that with a grain of salt. It is a larger number than the others, but it's probably not meant to be 42%. We've then taken this with the ever-present Hitomi spectrum of Perseus. And we've done some fits uh, to that spectrum uh, th where we have varied those 10, 14 atomic data parameters, the resonance scattering, uh, sorry, the electron collision strength and the transition probability for each of those lines and rerun the whole of the APEC calculation and then fitted with that new set of atomic data in each case. And we've done that a thousand times to see what happens to uh, the fitting parameters you get out of your model of Perseus. The dashed line here shows what the answer should be. That's the published value from the Perseus results. Um, the uh, histogram shows you the, well, the values we get out from our various fits, and the shaded area shows you the uncertainty on the original fit. So in most cases, it's falling in the error bars. But you get some trends which are strangely white. Why is my line white? That's weird. Okay, the invisible white line is not meant to be invisible. Um, I don't know what happened there. Uh, it was blue earlier. So, the, um, so you get some correlations out from this very few atomic data parameters, which are actually possibly quite significant. Um, in particular, uh, you get the temperature has a... Uh, correlation with the transition probability for the forbidden line, which came as a slight surprise. But the main one, uh, the abundances are highly dependent on these collision prob probabilities uh, for, in this case, the forbidden line and also the intercombination line. It's obviously there's a large scatter on this graph. I say it's highly correlated. You can draw a straight line through anything. Um, these R values are not that strong, but you can definitely see with your eyes there is a correlation. Uh, there's, more there's more work to be done here to try and nail down what's driving all of these. This is sort of expected. The resonance scattering factor increases as you increase the strength of the forbidden as a resonance line because this has to match the spectrum. So that one sort of makes sense. Um, the point I'm trying to get across here is that these are, you know, this is a variation of 20% or so in abundance um, for a not implausible uncertainty in the collision rate for the forbidden line. Uh, this is now a tool that people can mess with and change you can put in your own uncertainties you can change what atomic data you think you have uncertainties on and compare it to your data and run it and it works reasonably for quickly it's still a monte carlo approach so it can take you it can take you a month if you want to run enough monte carlo iterations but uh, you can get the spectrum and get some uncertainty on your uh results uh, and see how sensitive it is to the atomic data that you know or don't know Okay, this is the another approach to uncertainties, which I will discuss briefly. <laughs> um, so this is coming at it from the other end. This is saying, okay, I have an atomic data calculation, the atomic structure, we start there. What does that mean 
for the uncertainties on the atomic data from first principles. I'm not looking at my spectrum at the end. I'm looking at, well, I have an atomic structure where I, if I shift around the parameters and that, how do my line intensities ultimately shift? But it doesn't go straight to line intensities. It goes to energy levels. It goes to A values. Those feed into recombination rates, excitation rates, ionization rates. All of these things are then correlated on that, based on that initial change to your atomic structure calculation. Uh, there's a lot going on in this graph, which I will only briefly describe, but basically you can see some of these parameters, these are different energies based on shifting the uh, atomic structure parameters in an autostructure calculation. Some of these are very tightly correlated. Some of these are not so correlated. Uh, and and uh, this has an effect when you see, look, convert all of this, you follow this through to get into this graph on the right here, which is dielectronic recombination rates on the top. Uh, the interesting and complicated feature are, does this work? Yes. These little shapes, which actually match the cursor. Look at that. Um, so these are violin plots of the uncertainties in DR rates. Uh, this basically it's, you can see there is a blob of likely dielectronic recombination rates at the top and a blob at the bottom and not much in between. And this is because DR is a resonant process. So it depends on exactly where the energy levels end up going when you shift your structure. If it drops above or below the threshold, you suddenly turn on or off a DR channel and you get like either, you get either a high rate or a low rate. But at least interesting question of how do you put that into a database with an uncertainty on it? I, I, it's very difficult to put a sigma number on that. Yeah, plus or minus what? Um, so that's sort of a question for discussion. <laughs> I'm open to answers on that one. We have ways we could do it, but it would mean distributing a database with like a hundred copies of the database with these distributions in it. Um, um, okay, last feature, because I'm running out of time and we're all behind time. Uh, this is very, very uh, into the weeds of comp computation, but XPEC is great. We all love XPEC. And those that don't love XPEC use something similar to XPEC. Um, the nice people at XPEC have been, have made Py XPEC, the Python version, which lots of people use, but not as many as regular XPEC because uh, we're all, you know, set in our ways and do what we did before. Uh, writing models in Python is very easy. Writing models in C is slightly harder. Um, we ended up with a situation where we developed a whole pile of models in Python, which couldn't be used at a regular XPEC, which we thought wouldn't be a problem because PyXPEC is the way of the future. Turns out not everybody wants to use PyXPEC. It's fair. So we've had a summer student, Arthea Valderrama, who's been working on this, uh, and she has converted, she's written a wrapper basically, so that now in regular XPEC, you can call Python models directly. Um, this is like a minor detail for many things, but it means that a lot of our models now just work in XPEC and I don't need to sit there and rewrite lots of stuff in C. So I'm very happy. Uh, this fantastic graph at the bottom is basically showing these are the same. So yay, it works both ways. Uh, anyway, you can, you, can, you can now do this and it works for all Python only models. So it's not just for our models. It's a generic interface. So it's a handy tool. Um, I am out of time, so I will skip this, largely speaking, but it's, we've been working on the charge exchange model. Uh, it has now been rewritten to run much faster. It used to take like 10 minutes, now it takes about two seconds. Um, and includes line broadening and is having new data added to it for different elements. Um, and here's a bunch of future plans, which I will just leave up because we're all late for lunch and we've got a talk to go still. Not that late. There's one more talk to go yet. Question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adam. Nice talk and thanks for all the updates and cool features. Very looking forward to use them. Uh, I actually have a question about the first part and the resonance scattering. Sure. Uh, so you, you said that you were following the Shigayama 1998 approach where basically which is applicable for uh, like narrow, very long bars along the line of sight. Mm. Uh, 
if I understood correctly, this is what you're following, right? Because this is not exactly what we have in galaxies or clusters, extended sources. It's important that we have taken into account radial information about emissivity and right. optical depths, all of that. So yeah, yes. to clarify. So that's, so the, the, the bar line of sight is this part here, which is a solid line. This is an approximation to exactly. uh, shells. So we have this in here as well. So you can do both. You can, you can switch on the including shells model as well as just the line of sight bar. But then how do you treat scattering there? Because well, your probability of scattering will a lot depends on what is your local radial information. Yes. So we've used their approximation for a simple one-off. I, I think we need to do the radial steps as the next step of the model. Oh. That, that is the next step to do it properly. But we've got an approximation in there for now, which is basically taking the results of their numerical simulation and copying it, the dots on that graph, where they've done the sequential like, bar absorbed by the next bar and so on to simulate concentric shells. So it's not really applicable right now for probably- This actually works pretty well. This, this, I mean, is it perfect? No, uh, but it's better than the bar approximation. Um, so it's getting there. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'd be interested Thanks. to see how it compares to some of the more complicated models. And then we will do the, the proper transfers. All right. So we have to be careful how we interpret parameters that we're getting. Yes. We're still, we're still figuring out how to like, craft that into the paper to make sense and not lead people astray. Yes. Super quick question about wrapping uh, Python stuff in XPEC. Like how, like what are the execution um, times? Like um, I would have thought that that will slow you down a lot. I I mean, yes and no. It uh, depends what you're doing in Python. If you write the same model in Python, it will run slower than in, in C, but not. It depends on your model. Uh, I mean, how long is a piece of string? Yes, it is slower. Is it significantly slower? Depends on what you're doing. Sorry, um, it's not. <laughs> yeah, back to the resonance scattering. The uh, Of course, we're talking about effective scattering because, uh, again, we're scattering into the line of sight and out of the line of sight, so both. Um, I think uh, my impression is that everybody thinks of scattering out of the line of sight, so losing photons, but we're also winning some. And if you know, you're know you winning 80% of the photons, you're losing 80%, 85% of the photons, then we only see 5%. So the TOR um, you're determining in your model is an effective TOR. It's not a real TOR, right? Uh, true, yes. I mean, you're right. This is so going back to the graph with the orange, uh, with the pink, uh, I mean, yes, it's the short with answer. bar, where have I put uh, this back? That one. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I agree with you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just, just to be aware yeah. of, you know, it's not criticism, just there. reality is not nice. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Let's move on. Last talk of the session. Okay. Uh, new paradigm X-ray and spectral fitting, Carterea, University of Montreal. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so you just have to listen to me for 12 minutes, uh, and then we can go for lunch. Uh, my name is Carterea. I'm at University de Montréal. This work um, has been done in collaboration with my PhD advisor, Julie Labachette Le Rondeau, uh, also with some folks over at the CF. Uh, namely Akko Spagen and Ralph Kraft, and of course some help from the Machine Learning Institute in Montreal, uh, Mila. So today I'm going to be showing you some really exciting results that we have um, where we're able to deconvolve X-ray spectrum uh, from Chandra for the first time using machine learning. So for a little bit to uh, explain what the problem is, what do we see when we actually look at an X-ray spectrum with Chandra? Uh, this is just using your standard uh, ACSI or ACSS detectors. And I work on galaxy clusters, so I'm going to show typical galaxy cluster spectrum, but you can input whatever spectrum you prefer. Uh, so what do we actually observe? For a typical X-ray spectrum, um, as seen by Chandra, we have a very large um, power law continuum, and we have these little squiggles, which are our uh, emission lines. And you can see things are very smoothed out. It's hard to pinpoint individual emission lines in the reason behind this um, may not be obvious, but if you've worked with Chandra, you're very familiar with the response matrix um, in Chandra, and the response matrix effectively 
smooths out a lot of the continue or a lot of the emission that we're actually seeing. So from the models, we know that the true source spectrum would look something like this with, again, you have your continuum emission and uh, you have a lot of information coming from the spectral emission lines. But when we actually observe this with Chandra, we're seeing something very smoothed out due to the response matrices. Uh, I'm actually just going to skip the discussion on the response matrices uh, since we talked a little bit about that too. So for us, what we wanted to do was we wanted to say, okay, instead of uh, dealing with the observed spectrum, we want to find a way to be able to recover the true intrinsic spectrum of our source. To do this, we needed to look at the mathematical formulation relating the observed spectrum and the true spectrum. Like I've indicated, this goes back to your response matrix. Um, so you can rewrite the relationship between the observed spectrum and the uh, true spectrum of your source by doing a convolution or doing an integral, uh, taking into account the response function of a telescope. This is great if you're working in continuum photon energy space and tetraphoton energy space, but we don't work in a continuum space. Instead, we work in a discrete space. Uh, so Castor and Blecker showed in 2016 that we can go ahead and discretize our equation, which is really nice. So instead of dealing with um, a vector for, or instead of dealing with this continuous vector of our observed spectrum and our real and our intrinsic spectrum, now we have vector quantities. So this would be exactly what you measure normally and would throw into um, XBEC. We also have a response matrix that is calculated directly from the instrument that you're using. This is a quantity that, of course, we can pull out and normally use. And if you're looking at this equation, you'd say, well, uh, in college, when I took linear algebra one, I learned how to solve these types of equations. You simply invert your response matrix, multiply both sides by the inverted response matrix, and voila, you have your true spectrum. Unfortunately, life is not quite this simple. The response matrix is extremely tricky and is highly singular. We threw a number of different regularization techniques and some Bayesian techniques at this problem in our research note from 2021, trying to solve this uh, using standard statistical techniques. At the end of the day, uh, the answer is no, you can't use normal techniques. This might give you an indication why for the last 30 years, nobody's been bothering to do this. Um, but so what we decided to do was uh, there's a strong machine learning community in Montreal. So we decided, well, can we use machine learning to help us try to solve this problem? And to do that, we turned to a um, machine learning model architecture known as a recurrent inference machine. And what a recurrent inference machine does broadly is it solves your inverse problem. So it solves a linear equation, AX is equal to B, in an iterative manner using neural networks. And it uses that to update your solution at each time step. This had been shown to work very well for ALMA data. Uh, so ALMA, it very briefly, uh, effectively has to solve this exact same equation, uh, which is the same equation that we're trying to solve in 1D, where you'd start with a dirty image. So that would be your obs observed image. You have a response, which takes into account the UV coverage and beam size. And you try to recover what the true image would look like to get these these are gravitationally lens systems, but you can go for whatever type of system. Normally people use um, methods like clean or T-clean, but these are extremely computationally expensive and are prone to errors. And these authors, uh, namely Morningstar and Perrault Le Dossier, showed that you can actually use a recurrent inference machine to do this problem much faster, uh, which with much more faithful reconstructions. So we thought this is perfect for us. We need to do the 1D equivalent of this problem. For those of you who are interested in the more technical side of the machine learning algorithm, effectively what we're doing is we're passing a score, which is the gradient of a likelihood function, describing uh, the relationship between the observed spectrum, the response matrix, and our true intrinsic spectrum. It gets passed to a, a block containing convolutional layers and recurrent units. Um, it's a whole bunch of technical jargon that I'm happy to get into later in the discussions, but I'm just going to pass for now. But effectively, this is iteratively solving um, our inverse problem. So what does this look like for models of X-ray spectrum? Here I've shown 10 random realizations of uh, mock observed spectrum with noise. 
And the idea is we want to be able to pass our mock uh, observed spectrum and the response matrix uh, to our recurrent inference machine to recover the true underlying spectrum. So after training, um, which takes about five hours on a single GPU, so it's pretty quick, um, how well can we do? So again, this is one of our observed spectrum here. I've just smoothed out the noise uh, just for um, uh, visualization purposes. So we have our observed spectrum. What I'm going to show now is the true spectrum. So this is what we're hoping to recover with our current inference machine. And in the orange dashed line or yellow, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with colors, um, you can see that the reconstruction or the prediction from the recurrent inference machine is in really good agreement with the actual intrinsic spectrum. Uh, of course, we didn't just do this for one spectrum and one type of underlying intrinsic spectrum. We did this for a large suite of models. Um, here I'm just showing how this stacks up with some random realizations. You'll notice that it's not perfect, um, but it is doing a pretty good job. I'm really happy to announce that today, as of 5 a.m., uh, we were finally able to get this to work with real data, uh, so not just simulations. I obviously didn't have time to put those plots uh, here, but I'm happy to show them to anybody and talk to you about them uh, throughout the conference. So the question for us really is next steps. I was going to say the next step is to get this to work for real data, but that's checked off. Uh, why is this actually useful, right? So I'm going back to the point of why do we care about being able to deconvolve X-ray spectrum? We already know how to fit X-ray spectrum using forward modeling. Uh, what this allows us to do is it allows us to stack X-ray spectrums. Instead of having to do these massive simultaneous fits, you can just deconvolve your spectrum of the same object and stack them together. This can be helpful in studying transient sources. You can also use this um, to study calibration targets in Chandra. And by comparing the deconvolved intrinsic spectrum, you can look for potential errors or uncertainties in the Chandra calibration, which can then inform us how to uh, update the Chandra calibration. This is work led by um, another student, Marine Prunier, uh, at l'Université de Montréal. Uh, and you can also use these deconvolved spectrum to uh, train neural networks to be able to extract underlying parameters that you're interested in. So with that, I just want to say thank you all very much. And we're really curious to know if anybody has ideas of how we can use their current inference machine and deconvolve X-ray spectrum to help you with your science. So thank you. Lots of questions. Just a quick one. You said it took about five hours to do the training. What what What's involved in the training? How do you do that? Yep. Uh, so for the training, effectively what we need to do is we need to give the uh, recurrent inference machine a suite of intrinsic spectrum. So for us, we're looking at uh, galaxy clusters, so allowing the temperature, metallicity, things like that to vary and a suite of response matrices. To collect the response matrices, we've collected about 10,000 response matrices from the Chandra archive, just doing data mining. Uh, that's all we give to the network. Um, and along with the observed spectrum that you would see by combining the underlying real model with the response matrix. That's all we throw at the network. Is it restricted to uh, bright sources or there's a required minimum counts per source? And the other question is, you didn't mention the extinction. It also, I think I, you're also... I didn't mention the... Extinction? So you have an observed spectrum, then you have synthetic. Yeah, that's right. I did not uh, mention that for a good reason, but I'm really happy to talk to you about it after this. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot what the first half of your... The number of counts. Ah, yes. So this is for high signal-to-noise regimes. Uh, we're working on another model uh, using a diffusion model, which is, if you're familiar with Dolly or generative images, it's the same machine learning algorithm behind that. Uh, we've learned that that actually works a lot better with low signal-to-noise regions and can give you uncertainties on your reconstructions, but it's not quite as good as using the recurrent inference machine that we're using. Quick related question. Yes. Can you go to your last slide? Yes. So on the far left, you've yeah, got like sorry. nothing in the blue, but you have a powerful feature in the recovery. Is that, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but you're able to. Yes, we are, because there's a whole lot of information um, in the response matrix. What we can also do, and what we've done here, is we've reconstructed a prior space using a diffusion model, which also helps us recover some of that information hidden in our 
response matrices. And I think there are a couple more. You're keeping people from going to lunch. By asking you you can ask me questions later. Uh, I'll be around all week. Yeah, one question. Uh, this, of course, you use a class of models like the APEC model or so to test it. So That's right. suppose that Adam by accident or I have made by accident some mistake by ignoring one line. Then you, can you recover that line then from your reconstruction or it just depends on the class, I guess? Eh? Uh, I will say yes and absolutely no. Um, no, we cannot. However, when you include uncertainties, you would expect to see a very large uncertainty in those regions. So that might be an indication that a certain line is missing. That's something that we plan on looking at uh, in more detail with CRISM. And a related question, you learn a trend here on isothermal spectra or can you do multi-temperature plasmas? Because most sources have multiple temperature components and with the forward folding techniques, you can fit the strengths and temperatures of these components. So can you do the same with this method? Yes, you could very easily retrain on uh, multiple thermal component spectra. Um. So I was wondering, how do you handle background? So the background is included in the intrinsic source spectrum. Uh, so we that would come with a different RMF though, response. Pardon? That would come with a different response. So. That's correct as well. Um, that would have to be folded in, uh, depending on the okay, background. Or, Sorry. Uh, I just wonder. I mean, re reconstruct. If, if we consider an RGS spectrum, the true spectrum, and the PN spectrum in XMM, these smeared out. Could you train? A model to reconstruct from a PN spectrum, an RGS spectrum, that would be model independent because you're putting in all these questions come from, you know, what if, you know, in the RGS and you have the same source simultaneously. Would yes, that be possible? Yes, you absolutely could. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about actually going about and implementing that because that would be a really wonderful application. Thank you. One more. Well, you know, we got we got too many more, too many one more that people are asking more than one. Okay, yeah, get one from. Uh, okay, this one's from Sean Gunderson. Uh, if we want to use this technique, where can we go to get the code or codes? Uh, thank you, one, for asking that. Two, you can wait uh, maybe about a month and a half, and this is all going to be open source uh, on GitHub. We're just finishing up the AppJ publication. Okay, so more questions will defer to lunch. Uh, or Slack. Uh, I'll put my GitHub um, re handle on Slack. Sure, so you can there, there. Are okay. Um, it's time for lunch. Lunch will be served in my lot. Oh, thank you. <laughs>